Do you use WhatsApp, the smartphone messaging service? Around the world, more than 500 million people do. And we all have Yan Koom to thank for that. And also the United States for allowing him to move there, age 16, from his native Ukraine. And Facebook thinks that what Yan Koom has created is so valuable that it had recently bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. Yet if a young Ukrainian arrived in Denmark today, how would you view them? Would they be welcome? Would they be seen as a threat or a burden? Would they simply be turned away? Think about it. How many talented and dynamic people like Yang Koom, with lots to contribute, does Denmark turn away or scare off? And at what cost? Now, of course, Yan Koom's success is exceptional, but it's far from unique. Google, Yahoo, eBay, PayPal, LinkedIn, YouTube. Indeed, around half of the recent startups in Silicon Valley were co-founded by immigrants and around a quarter of those across the United States. And newcomers' children have an outsized impact, too, because Apple's Steve Jobs had a Syrian-born father, and Amazon's Jeff Bezos is the son of Cuban immigrants. In fact, 15 of America's 25 most valuable technology companies were co-founded by migrants and their children, as were 42% of Fortune 500 companies, 42%. Now, Europe may not be America, but that dynamism dividend can be reaped here, too. Let me tell you about Saeed Esmail Sadim. He was born in Iran and he moved to Sweden as a refugee, aged eight. And when he was growing up in the 1980s, his parents were unemployed, and he resolved that he was not going to suffer the same fate. He studied hard, and at the age of 28, he became Sweden's youngest associate professor. That's a pr that is impressive enough. And then he went on to discover the world's hardest glass, and he set up his own company to commercialize it. And since then, Saeed has built up over 15 businesses to sell all sorts of groundbreaking innovations. They include a medical technology company, which is quoted on the NASDAQ which designs and manufactures individually customized implants for damaged joints, and a clean tech technology company that manufactures environmentally friendly ways to treat wool pulp and textiles. Saeed Esmailzadeh is exceptional, but not unique. Look at Britain, Britain's most valuable technology company, ARM Holdings, which designs the, the chips in almost every smartphone, was founded with, with the help of an Austrian immigrant. Or Europe's most profitable airline, EasyJet, was established by a Greek entrepreneur in Britain. Across Europe, migrants and their children are much more likely to be entrepreneurs than local people, twice as likely in the case of Britain. And that shouldn't be really su that surprising, because if you think about it, migration is a bit like starting a business. 
It's a risky venture. It takes hard work to make it pay off. And if you arrive in a country without contacts or a conventional career, it's the natural way to get ahead. So dynamic immigrants can play a crucial role as entrepreneurs who create jobs and wealth for the rest of society. And their diversity can also provide a big dividend to each and every business in Denmark and to the economy as a whole. Because the, the key to sustained economic growth in advanced economies like Denmark is finding new and different ways of doing things and deploying them across the economy. And to spark new ideas, you need people who think differently. Now, brilliant new ideas sometimes spring from individual geniuses. And those people are disproportionately migrants. Three in 10 Nobel laureates were born abroad. And they include Andre Game, a Russian-born scientist who developed a revolutionary new supermaterial called graphene at the University of Manchester. But new ideas mostly come from people sparking off each other. And a growing volume of research shows that, that groups with a diverse range of perspectives and experiences can solve problems better and faster than like-minded experts. Two heads are only better than one if they think differently. So whether your business involves designing new medicines, developing computer games, coming up with clean technologies, providing original management advice, indeed, any kind of problem solving, having diverse people working there can make all the difference. Just look at Skype, Europe's most valuable internet startup. It was co-founded by a Dane working with a Swede and Estonian programmers. And in 2011, Microsoft bought it for $8.5 billion. Now, it's been said that it would be better if immigrants were more like us. And it's true. Everyone benefits if they can speak the same language and an international business that is increasingly English. But the main economic benefit of migration comes precisely from the fact that migrants are different, and their differences complement local needs and conditions. So newcomers may have skills that not enough Danes have, like medical training or the ability to speak fluent Mandarin. They may have contacts that open up new opportunities for trade and investment. They may be more willing to do jobs that Danes with higher living standards, higher education, or higher aspirations no longer want to do, like work on farms or care for the elderly, which is the fastest area of employment growth in Europe. They may simply be young and hardworking, a huge bonus to aging societies with shrinking workforces and huge numbers of pensioners to pay for. And having moved once, they tend to be more willing to move again and therefore help the economy adjust to change. And as I mentioned, their diverse perspectives and experiences can help spark new ideas. And then as entrepreneurs, they can help deploy those ideas across the economy. So let's face it. If newcomers were the same as local people, they would bring nothing extra to the party, except perhaps economies of scale. 
the big picture is that as our world becomes ever more connected through trade, investment, and the internet, it is increasingly important for people to be able to move freely too. That's obvious if you're a big global company like Maersk or Microsoft who need to employ the right person in the right place at the right time. And it's especially true for smaller companies where every single team, meta, team member matters. I once interviewed a Swedish businessman called Darius Stenberg. And his company makes alloys that are used to make fillings for teeth. And he exports these, business, he exports these alloys uh, to China. And he's doing really, really well doing that because his local operations in Beijing are run by a Chinese manager who previously lived in Sweden for 11 years. He speaks fluent Mandarin as well as fluent Swedish, and he knows how business works in both countries. People like that are exceptionally rare. And in our complex economies, where skills are ever more specialized, getting the person with the right combination of skills is all important. When did you last see a job ad for a generic sales manager or a standard employee? You don't. And the notion that skilled workers are interchangeable and that locals could easily fill the jobs that they do is misconceived. Now, in this new global economy, the center of gravity is shifting east and south as the rest of the world catches up with the West. People increasingly moving in all directions, mostly temporarily. And even successful economies like Denmark increasingly need to compete to attract the talent they need. Now, some countries are already seizing the opportunities of this new global economy. Countries like Australia and Canada are competing to attract skilled mobile workers. China is increasingly a magnet for talent, not just for returning Chinese, but increasingly for Westerners, too. So much so that some people in Silicon Valley are worried about a brain drain to Asia. And of course, Asia is a source of talent, too. China generates more graduates than all of Europe put together, and India is not far behind. Denmark cannot take for granted that they will want to move here. Over a decade ago, when Germany introduced a visa program to attract highly skilled Indians, a German politician protested that the country needed Kinder Stadt Inder, children, not Indians. But as it turns out, the visa places were never filled because highly skilled Indians preferred to go work in California or stay at home in Bangalore than move to Bavaria. Now, it's often argued, and it's been said today, that governments should select only the right immigrants that a country needs and turn away the rest. But in practice, it's impossible to identify in advance how much anyone is going to contribute to society let alone their children, as the examples of Yan Koum, Saeed, Esmail Sadeh, and many, many others shows. Governments just aren't any good at picking winners. They don't have the requisite information to do so. And they are incapable 
of second-guessing second the labor market needs of an entire economy. Manpower planning didn't work in the Soviet Union, and it doesn't work in migration policy either. So instead of trying to micromanage who can come into a country and who can't, and most likely making big macro mistakes, Denmark should take a leaf out of Sweden's book. Businesses that can't find suitable local workers can hire workers of all skill levels from around the world on two-year renewable visas. It's a flexible, growth-friendly system that is in keeping with the needs of this new global economy. Now, to attract the talent that Denmark needs, it's important to get the immigration rules right. And of course, it's important to provide attractive pay uh, and career development uh, for pre to prospective migrants. But it's especially important to make foreigners feel welcome. Would you go work somewhere where you didn't feel wanted? That's why the tone of the political debate is so important. If you talk about migrants in a relentlessly negative way, it's not just inaccurate, it harms the Danish economy. Study after study confirms that, in general, migrants do not harm the job prospects of local people. They don't burden the welfare state. So it's about time people stopped going on about so-called social dumping or welfare tourism. If you think about it, the fears that migrants are going to take local people's jobs are a bit like the old fears that women were going to take men's jobs. But of course, that isn't true. Now, most women work, and so do most men. People don't just take jobs, they also create them. Immigrants create jobs when they spend their wages. And they create jobs in complementary lines of work. So Polish builders here in Denmark create jobs for Danish architects and Danish people selling building supplies. And overall, migrants tend to have a positive impact on local people's wages precisely because of those complementarities. It's also completely implausible that people would be enterprising enough to move to another country and then suddenly want to claim welfare then when they would be better off working. And we had a natural experiment to test this. Back in 2004, three countries opened their borders to the people from the new member states in Eastern Europe. Did Poles all rush uh, to Sweden uh, to claim uh, welfare, the, probably the most generous welfare uh, in the world? No, 99% of Poles moved to Britain and Ireland to work. And the 1% who did move to Sweden also moved to work. And then you look at a recent OECD study confirming that migrants in Denmark are net contributors to public finances overall. So my message is simple. To thrive in the new global economy, Denmark needs to be open to outsiders. And to be a magnet for talent, you need three things, at least. An attractive business environment, an immigration system that enables businesses to recruit the people that the economy needs, and last but not least, you need to make foreigners feel welcome. Thank you.